everybody um, to, uh, to to the meeting um, on uh, what is in Australia Tuesday, December the 18th, and everywhere else it's uh, Monday, December the 17th. Uh, this is a, a project meeting for the Open Source Drug Discovery for Malaria project. Um, and uh, presenting on the webcams are me, Matt Todd, and, and Paul Willis from MMV, and the other participants are listed on, on the side there. Um, like I said, at any point, uh, anybody else can uh, chip in with something audio, just let me know, and I can enable uh, audio so that people can, can chip in too. Uh, before we get started with the uh, agenda, where we'll, we'll get started with something fairly um, technical and, and uh, medicinal chemistry heavy, um, did it, before we, we, we launch into that, does anyone want to say um, anything by way of intro, or does anyone want to ask a question about um, the project or the nature of the meeting or how we'll run it? I just want to make sure everyone has questions that are answered. If you want to alert me, you can chat there, or there's a raise your hand um, uh, facility in this meeting space. I'm perfectly happy to enable anyone's audio and to keep it enabled. Um, I, I tend to try and keep things Disable just to try and keep it simpler, uh, try and minimize the lag time with the video and just to try and minimize the noise with the audio. But of course, I want to make sure that anyone can say something if they want to. Okay, um, thanks to a few of you for turning up. I, I, it's very nice to, um, to see you guys here. Um, uh, Jen, I think, was coming from opensource.com and finding out what we're doing. Um, and it's very good to see that Mike Palastri is here. Um, who in the past has expressed an interest in, in uh, doing open source drug discovery. So I'm hoping really that we can uh, find ways of, um, of uh, uh, working in a, in a complementary way. So it, it's great everybody join us. Thanks for coming, Mike. Um, and my greatest, hi, 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 it's been a long time. Uh, very nice that you can, uh, you can be uh, here too. Um, so if, uh, yeah, if you want to type something about what you're doing in, in the chat box, um, go ahead. If anyone wants to say a couple of things about uh, that, we can do that now. Um, no problem. Um, and thanks for coming, Ginger Taylor, as well. So Ginger's just joined us. She uh, started the Synaptic Leap uh, way back in 2005. So very nice of you to join us. Thank you, Ginger. Early for you in California. Okay. Um, uh, if anyone wants to say something at any point, just let me know. Otherwise, we can um, get started. So the purpose of this um, meeting was to have a general project discussion about what's going on in the, um, the Drug Discovery for Malaria project. But uh, we also have got to a point um, where we need to think about a decision on, um, on a series that we've been looking at, uh, the ARL Purell series. So the first series that we had a really, um, a really good look at um, and I posted the agenda uh, for the meeting on the Synaptic Leap page. So that's the, uh, the link at the top of the discussion notes window there. So Synaptic Leap page 434 has all of the text that's shown in that window there, but with the links. And all of the links go to all of the primary data, and, and the text there summarizes some of the key findings of what we were doing. Um, so we've been going this series for, for a number of months now. Um, and just by way of a very quick summary, um, we, of course, started with a couple of ARL Pyrrhal compounds from the GSK series that was released into the public domain. Um, those in the project were OSMS 5 and 6, so the ones shown in the first round of evaluation um, text there. We began by um, demonstrating that those compounds were active, uh, biologically active, and in a whole cell assay. We then um, began to synthesize a number of variants of those compounds. And we also synthesized a number of compounds in what's known as the near neighbor set. Um, so a similar, structurally similar set of compounds with a slightly different heterocycle, um, top right as the compounds normally drawn. Um, we found by exploring those compounds that some, uh, some variations we made in the original compounds, the ARL pyrrhal compounds, were uh, we tended to um, decrease activity. Um, but some of the changes we made in the near neighbor set um, made compounds that were extremely potent. Uh, at the expense of the compounds being extremely insoluble. Um, so those, those, those are the two things that we, that we found in the kind of second round of evaluation. Uh, we took on uh, one or two of the near neighbor compounds and the two original compounds for some more biological evaluation. Uh, and the four types of biological evaluation shown there. So 
There were metabolic assays, the Herg assay, late stage gametophyte assay, and an in vivo assay. And I guess the upshot of, of all of that was um, that the original GSK compounds um, were being metabolized, um, most likely because they contained a master. Um, the near neighbor step had problems with solubility, which limited our ability to really handle those. Um, but they appeared, uh, as much as they could be, to be resistant to uh, metabolism in some of these simple microsome based assays. Uh, both steps represented members of steps past this Herg assay. The near neighbor step were uh, potent in the late stage gametocyte, gametocyte assay, which was very promising. Um, uh, whereas the original GSK compound that was evaluated was found not to be uh, active in that. Late stage gametocyte activity is, 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 I guess, quite rare from what I can uh, discern. So that was a plus for the near neighbor compound. Um, the in vivo assay, however, showed that there was no oral e efficacy for um, the, uh, the compounds that we were looking at, essentially. And the PK data that came back suggested that that was because the compounds were being metabolized. So there was a, there was initially the compound was present in mouse plasma, but um, over time, over about four hours, the compound uh, decreased significantly. So it appeared that they were bioavailable, as far as we could tell, but um, they were being metabolized. So the third round of synthesis and evaluation was done, and that's what we've just concluded. We've done sort of three sets within that third round. And though that, that chemistry was intended to uh, explore changing the, the ester component of the compound as well as changing, um, the again, the top right uh, portion of the compound, the heterocyclic portion of the compound, so not the aryl curl but everything else. Um, and I guess the, the conclusions from that um, has been that uh, small changes in these compounds will, will eliminate activity. So the ester seems to be extremely important. Uh, changing that to, um, to an amide, for example, eliminates all the activity of the compound. We found that, uh, that we couldn't really change a lot of things about the, the upper right-hand portion of the molecule. Uh, it seemed to be very sensitive um, to that. Changes. And we haven't really found a lot of compounds um, as, part of, as part of our um, exploration of diverse functionality. We haven't really found a lot of compounds that show decent activity once we've changed things. We haven't, of course, changed much about the aryl pyrrole itself. We've changed the, the rest of the molecule, but we, we found that basically, yes, the, the ester was pretty sensitive and, and other things wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't really be changed very much. Uh, for example, in the original GSK compound, we had a primary amide, so an NH2 group on the top right, uh, introduction of methyl groups, uh, one and two methyl groups sequentially decreased activity substantially. Really quite, quite a sensitive compound. Um, so that's pretty much where we stand. Um, we've got about 100 compounds, or just over 100 compounds in the project now. And so um, Murray and Alice have been very busy at teasing out trends um, in the data. And some of those links are shown towards the bottom of the agenda. Um, on the Synaptic Link page, they're shown as links. On the discussion notes, they're shown as just the raw, the raw um, links, which will take you to pictures of the analysis that, that uh, Alice and Murray have done which is very nice, which just shows the, the kind of trends that I was just talking about. Um, uh, for example, when we tried to replace, we did do a small, a small change in the, in the pyrrole section, we tried to replace the pyrroles with pyrazoles, and that, that inevitably decreased activity. Um, we tried to replace the ester with uh, an oxazole, um, which is a pretty good replacement typically in MedChem. Um, also decreased activity, also decreased solubility by, by a lot. Um, and there are various other um, illustrations there of how replacing the ester with, for example, amides and amines. Uh, so um, that's all the, the data we have now. Um, uh, do uh, we we then I guess we finished off most recently um, trying to get a few of the compounds that we wanted for the paper that we're going to be writing, uh, and there were a couple of compounds, three compounds, which. We would still like to sort of close the loop on the academic side of things to uh, to get. So, for example, this ether compound, which has proven to be so synthetically uh, tricky, and a couple of others, um, we we still want those compounds, and we still have to make those compounds to include in the first publication. Uh, but more recently, uh, Murray and Alice have done a very nice um, search of. Um, of some of some of the compounds that are related in structure to the original compound, 
um, in the GSK set, which we didn't really include in our previous analysis, I guess. So, so spreading the net a bit more widely than our, our initial searches and found compounds in the original GSK set that were active, which included the ARL pyrrol section. Um, and have used those in a, in a design of some, uh, effectively some hybrid compounds, um, which is which, which are shown in the in the uh, the post that I've put the link for there, um, which are, I guess, uh, our, our best shot at thinking about perhaps some compounds that might be of interest based on you know us researching the original GSK set. There are sort of five obvious hybrids, I guess. There's some pretty, pretty nice, as well as five uh, or also um, uh, more, um, or more speculative structures. Um, so that's where we currently, yeah, so Alice has put the link there for the sort of hybrid compound, other actives that we found. So that's where we currently um, stand here. Um, and the, the, so the, I mean, I guess the first, there, there are some questions that I put in the discussion that, as far as I can see, um, a question that we need to be addressing is, uh, do we continue with some more compounds in this series? Uh, for example, these hybrid compounds. Secondly, I guess it would be good to talk about whether we, I'd like to just sort of revisit some of the data around the near neighbor stat, these thiazo lelinamines. Um, and thirdly, some of the modeling that Murray has done recently about whether or not um, these two sets of compounds actually may be hitting the same. Those are the kind of three sets of things that it would be good to talk about. So um, I don't know if, um, if Murray or Alice wanted to add something I may have forgotten to say, um, or whether or not, um, Paul, you wanted to jump in with some initial thoughts here. No, I think from my perspective, Matt, you set up the discussion nicely. So it's really probably just uh, uh, for me, it's discussing those key issues that you've raised. Okay. Um, so I think that um, yeah. So like I said, I think that the um, some of the compounds that we the, the last remaining compounds. So the for example, the ether compound and the, the sulfonamide compound. Um, we still, we still really want to get. Now, um, we've had a pretty good stab at the Zeta compound. Um, and with, 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 with not so much luck, it seems to be a real pain. We have, of course, had this interest from, um, from a, a CRO to make this compound. For the sulfonamide, um, Matt, and who's on the project, is still um, trying to get this thing. Uh, Patrick, who's joined us on, on this uh, call, uh, has also expressed an interest in, in having a go, I think, at that. By making that compound because I think he has some experience in related chemistry, which would be uh, which would be great. Uh, and of course, we're okay. That would be great. So we can, of course, help in any way um, facilitating that. But it would be a very nice input if we could, if, if Patrick was willing. And of course, we'd want to try and get it tested locally rather than trying to get it sent over to Sydney. And obviously, talk about how that might be done. But there is so there are there are some there are some things that we'd like to wrap up, and I think that probably we would need for publication because these are obvious things that would be nice to make. And of course, we've, we've sort of publicly declared that we'd like to try and make them, and so it would be nice to try and make them. Um, the um, the question I think the the as I was talking with with the um, the Sydney team a little bit earlier today, and, um, thinking about what we'd like to do here. Now, of course, the the choice, as you've said before in the past, Paul, very clearly, is is that we don't want to spend too much more time making a bunch of compounds. Um, uh, which we think might be active, but which end up not being active. I mean, we, none of us want to spend time making more compounds and just have them all, all, all be inactive. And so we, don't, we haven't really planned a set of compounds that are simple variations on what we've made already um, in the way that we did in the, in the past. So with our, with our consultation we've had in the past, we just suggested 10 variations, which, which kind of look sensible to explore the chemistry. Um, but I guess given, uh, given that we sort of found some related related looking compounds from searches. And we've included some of the structural features in the sort of hybrid compounds. I guess it was the feeling of the team here that it would be nice to have a stab at maybe five of those um, to see if we can, we can uh, yeah, 
more, I mean, I, I guess, you know, search for compounds which are, which have a, have a decent likelihood for being active. Now, of course, we don't know if they're going to be active, right? But they, they, they look pretty promising. Um, that's, our, that's our sort of gut feeling about some of those structures. And they look pretty, they look pretty nice. Um, synthetic accessibility doesn't look too bad either. I mean, they, they look like compounds that we have experience with. So I'm, we're, not, we're not thinking about making something. Uh, we're trying to use some of the, the hits that are around the original hits in the... Um, um, so, I mean, I think, I, I guess, you know, th th there's some enthusiasm for, for trying to get, a, you know, another five or so compounds out that, that use that. Um, that's for the aerial pyrrole set, obviously. So that's that's maintaining that that uh, that part of things. Uh, obviously, there, there's you know we, we the university shut down today in Australia. Um, we generally speaking, we're kind of you know um, on on semi holiday until about January the second. But come January, there's nothing really happening in the university except research. So January is a pretty a pretty nice time for doing. For doing so I guess uh, we were thinking about um, maybe having some time in January to, to try and do a few more of these compounds to see if we can explore. But I know in the past, Paul, you you expressed the opinion that you know we don't want to spend time uh, doing some essentially optimized, well, kind of optimization work when we're not we haven't yet um, given a green light to the series. So I guess we don't want to stray into. Um, too much of this kind of optimization work of making specific compounds. We still want to be in this kind of exploratory phase. Um, so we're not talking about making small variations of these molecules. We're trying to just uh, a, a set of five that are that are distinct. But I guess I just wondered, uh, you know, if you if you had thoughts on on that, you know, so giving it another, giving the aerial pyrroles another month with some of those hybrids to see what we see. Do you do you have the structures in, in front of you? Do people can see people see the structures I'm talking about? So, so Matt, can you can you just clarify? So you have there's, there's five targets that are obviously first target, and then another four that are second target. What which would be the specific five that you would be proposing that we would uh, attempt to make? So I think um, uh, Alice and Murray. I think uh, as as far as I remember, it's the, uh, the the ones you're enthusiastic about. Of course, were the first five. So it's that top line, I think. Um, you want to? Uh, can you talk, Alice? Or are you on a decent enough connection? Okay, um, you're on. You have to click the little button at the top of the screen, Alice, to, if you want to talk. But you're, you're enabled. Um, yeah, with the, the like the second row of compounds, so um, the kind of the stuff in the first targets box that we thought about um, mainly because the first two compounds represent the kind of head of another active compound, OSMS six, and um, Murray kind of pointed out that this this molecule, when it's attached to the RL pyrrole, is pretty symmetrical. So we were wondering about testing this kind of head group of the the pyrrole parallelosome um, and then the, the three other compounds are pretty much hybrids of um, an active um, indole compound that's just above above them in the orange box um, and the pyrroles are kind of uh, modifications based on the, the groups that's appended to the um, active uh, indole and the other active pyrrole and um, we were thinking specifically about trying to increase the polarity of this molecule so uh, they were the first ideas we had um, the, the the final compound on the on the, the furthest to the right is probably a little bit more complicated so the first four I think of the represent kind of the first targets uh, I don't know what what you think about those so the yeah the first two are, are fragments yeah they'd be and the other two the other two are, are related. They, of course, still have the ester there. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
and and this is driven yeah this is driven by by the the hits that are in the original TCAMs data set that are in the box there so those are the, obviously the, the the green box are the two originals and then the yellow and the red boxes are other hits that, are, that have been found do you do, so do, would you I mean obviously there are similarities with those structures there um, I don't know what your what 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 people's thoughts are there. Well, for me, the two esters are quite risky because I think uh, the ester is going to have to go in order to get an orally active compound from what we've seen. So to make just a diverse structure that carries another ester, I think that's, that, that looks a tough, long journey because, you know, if, if these first hits that you make are active, then you, you're going to set off straight away to have to replace the ester. So... I think it's it's it, it's potentially a long slog to get from there to where we need to be, so you know I wouldn't be minded to yes. do that at this stage. I'd, I'd be I'd be tempted to 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 select a new series. I think the fragments are interesting. It'd be interesting to know, Alice and, and Murray, whether you've searched back were those fragments actually in the uh, original HTSs. Have you searched them through Kemble? It would just be worth seeing whether they're they're already known. Uh, so, so that you know would be the first step there. I would have thought. Uh, and again, yeah, the fifth one uh, looks interesting. Uh, again, it's an nice steer. It's um, you know it looks a bit challenging. Uh, we're putting another uh, coral center in there, then, aren't we? So that it's it looks tough. So uh, I'm not sure. I, I think the two fragments, if we could buy them or quickly make them in a step or two and test them, that, that would be worth doing. The esters I wouldn't do, and, and the last one I'd probably judge more on the in, in synthetic uh, accessibility. If you could do it quickly, I'd do it, but, but it, because it's highly speculative, I wouldn't go in for a long program to make it. You could presumably get the fifth one from just from the aldehydes, and, and the synthetic accessibility isn't too bad at that point, providing you can buy the, the yellow. The other part and just couple them together. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, so the, yeah, the the salient point there though is that they they have the um, the ester, and our uh, you know attempts to date to to find a replacement for that um, have uh, we've certainly explored it and um, haven't found a way in which we can get rid of that. I had a um, um, a, uh, a look back at some of the, the metabolism data. Um, this is just a point I was thinking about earlier. Um, was that we uh, so some of the the work that was done by Sue Charman early on. Um, we were looking at some of the uh, some of the metabolic stability, and it appeared as though um, the stability was of the, of the ester compounds. So these the GSK compounds was not so great in in mouse plasma, but was better in human plasma. Um, and uh, I think that wasn't terribly surprising um, because apparently there are more non-specific esterases in rodent plasma. And so it made us think uh, about the, the in vivo results that, that maybe because we're using a mouse model, they were unfairly criticizing these compounds because they're less stable in mouse plasma. But I think, I, I think probably, I don't, I don't want to speak for Sue, I want to make sure that I, I, I represent it correctly, but I think she was probably saying that, well, you know, it may be that the compounds appear to be more stable in, in human plasma, but um, I think if you if you actually uh, did the assay properly in, in, in human plasma, you'd probably find that the assays are also not particularly stable in that environment too. Um, it's just that our assays to date have been based on, on, on mouse plasma. So um, I guess the, the the worry I had is that because of the, the lack of stability in mouse plasma, that would be it would be unfairly criticizing these compounds. But I'm not, of course, I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm not. I guess uh, you know one, one should expect the acid to be not particularly stable in human plasma. Uh, as you said, I think in the past, Paul, there are examples of compounds with acids in which are stable in human plasma, but there's not that many. No, so I think it should be tough, and um, you know, you you may be able to make a case that the ester would be more stable in human, but the problem is, you know, our screening cascade. We have to use the in vivo mouse model ultimately. If we took a compound forwards, we'll have to do rodent safety. So. It's very hard to, to cope with a compound that that, that is very unstable in, in in the rodent system. Just it makes the 
the drug discovery program phenomenally complicated. Um, so looking at some of these data, uh, you know, and go, just going back to the ASTA for a, for a moment, you know, we were we made a bunch of these um, uh, a bunch of changes to the molecule, um, including this prodrug hypothesis that we thought that maybe one of the active the reason why the original GSK compounds were active was because uh, the ASTA was um, original ASTA was prodrug, and and the, and the, you know half of the molecule um, would, uh, would would be responsible for the bio biological activity. Um, but you know we did the obvious prodrug uh, tests, and 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 all they all came back negative. So we we still don't really understand what's um, what's going on there. And I think this this led Murray to do a bit of uh, a bit of modeling recently, and it, it's preliminary work. And he's done he's done a lot here, but it's preliminary work that suggests that um, I, I guess I, I don't want to speak for you too much, Murray. Maybe you can chip in here, uh, but suggests that it's the, the ester is um, is is uh, is positioning parts of the molecule. In 3D, um, uh, and uh, and so so there's, there's, there's appears to be a, a, a decent model that he's developed for for which groups are needed where, and and it, it would appear that the ester positions these things in the right place, and the amide like doesn't. Um, do you want to talk about some of the some of the things you've learned from that process, Murray? Um, you want to enable your audio, I think. Hello, is that working? Hi. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, um, this is maybe all, or near enough, all useless now because, well, most of my modeling, um, everything points towards the ester. So um, that link I've just put up is um, the 3D poses of um, basically uh, five different, uh, sorry, uh, Doing a subsearch research of the Kemble database, you can get about 40, 40 RL per row, um, containing compounds. Uh, of those compounds, you can kind of cluster them into four sets, uh, sorry, five sets, which is in this uh, picture I've just attached. Um, so, um, apart from the near neighbor set, which is um, the, the, bo uh, the bottom on the middle there. Um, they all contain the ester, um, and even the first one is a, a diester. So I guess that's completely out the door. Um, so, uh, so in, in case people are unfamiliar to, to these sort of models, uh, the the circles or spheres are basically um, features. So uh, the red spheres are hydrogen bond acceptors. Uh, the green sphere is just a hydrophobic region, and the orange circles are um, just aromatic pi stacking areas. So, um, quite early on in this work, it was it became clear that um, these different cluster of compounds all mapped on a very simple uh, on, onto this simple hypothesis, which was quite nice to see. Um, I think most interestingly was that the near neighbors does fit into this map. So for the likes, the, the two compounds in the bottom, which will be um, OSMS6 uh, and uh, just one of the near neighbors. It's not the most active, but I, they all map to the same, the same position, obviously. Um, when I, 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 did, I, I did this set of work just before we got the last set of biological data back, and um, looking at this model, it, it, it suggested that um, uh, compound 103, which is basically the bottom left one, but it's the carbonyl and not the ester, would be active. So I boldly predicted that it would be active. Um, unfortunately, it, it showed some activity, but not enough to get an IC50. Um, so from this, I would take that the uh, the, the ester is sorry the yeah the ester linkage is required so this, there'll be another uh, hydrogen bond acceptor needed there so there'd be almost three in a row uh, and interestingly enough as well any any example we've made where there's a nitrogen or a hydrogen bond donor in that position um, activity completely falls off so um, the the amide, yeah, sorry, the amide, and also there's there's other examples within the GSK set that um, there's just 
very little or no activity there. Um, so from what's what's already been said, I think um, we definitely need a nicer steer of an ester there because that seems to be the the, the key function. Um, but um, if we are looking for new series, um, it'd be interesting to just use this to this these this hypothesis to just try and find a new core that would somehow fit into this. Um, we, um, it should be able to assist us in finding something that fits into a 3D space to, if, if we're looking to be on the same, to be, well, aiming towards working, uh, hitting the same target, then um, I, I have a fair bit of confidence in this this hypothesis. And just today, um, I, I put a, an appeal out for help on Twitter for people with a bit more experience and a bit more uh, software power. And I've already had two bites of people, new people, wanting to get involved. So um, it's not the best timing with Christmas and everything, but um, in the new year we will get that going, and uh, their their expertise should be able to help as well. I don't know. I think after you know Christmas dinner, I think a lot of people would be happy to sit back and do a bit of modeling. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think so. The, the the interesting thing I got from your analysis, though, Martin, was that you appeared to be predicting that the near neighbor compounds that we've been looking at were binding in the same way. Um, and the, of course, the the striking thing about the near neighbor set is that they don't have the ester. That's right. So it's the the sulfur is acting as the the um, other acceptor there. So you still have one carbonyl hitting one of the features very nicely, and um, the sulfur of that ring is appears to be acting as the hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, just just looking at this picture as well. I don't know. Actually, I'm, I could contradict myself by saying no. I'm not going to say that actually. <laughs> um, it, it's it's just hard to tell because it, that ester is screaming out to be helpful for the activity. Um, but I, I totally appreciate we want to get away from the ester or find a nicer steer that's as active. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's that's great. So the yeah. So so Paul, the um, I guess the the question uh, I had in my mind after Murray did that was um, was just to bring back in into uh, into my my thoughts whether or not we should be relooking at the um, role of the near neighbor set. Which initially, of course, had had two problems: one, a solubility, and one that uh, it had this functional group, which was a, a bit of a red flag. Um, on, on on just on the red flag of the uh, of the functional group, the Michael acceptor, um, uh, we did a set. So Paul, before he post Paul before he left, did try and assess that by by reacting one of the near neighbors with a with a thiol, um, and also trying to reduce it with a hydride, and found that this thing was essentially completely unreactive. Uh, at that position. Now again, I was talking to Sue um, just recently, and she was saying that uh, she might be able to try and do um, a more realistic glutathione trapping experiment um, on one of the near neighbor compounds, uh, which might be, of course, of interest. Um, are you, uh, are you, Paul, um, uh, you know, solidly against the near neighbors from from that kind of intuitive level of just having a having a problem with solubility and also the function of I mean, I think it's that, and it's it's in terms of the ligand efficiency. If you look, say, in the um, uh, the box that you've got the two green compounds, there's a nice illustration of it on the the potential next set of targets. So, OSM five five at four hundred and four nanomolar, uh, but then you put you know next to it five six, which in essence is all of the same, is the same potency, but carrying you know a lot more molecular weight. For no more gain in potency, so in terms of the efficiency of binding, it, it doesn't look a step in the right direction to me because we're just having to make much bigger molecules to get to the same position. So they look as if we're heading in the wrong direction. So I think that's the challenge. You know, how to, how can you get into a space where you you harness that those interactions, but in smaller, simpler molecules that are actually going to bind more efficiently and I think that's the challenge. Is is it going to be achievable in this series or not? 
So there was one um, which I think was uh, OSM S35, which was pretty small. Um, again, the log P, I think, is pretty bad. But that was, I think that was the one that we, we evaluated uh, more fully. Um, and there, the liquid efficiency isn't too bad, I think. It just contains a, a top loop, which isn't particularly elaborate. Um, I don't have the structure on me. Uh, uh, Alex or Murray, if you were able to find the structure of OSM S35, it may be on the story so far document. Um, in fact. Um, but there it's a, it's a sort of smaller, um, uh, a smaller structure. And I guess you compare to some of the ones that we were seeing, of course, then, then it's not quite so bad. Um, let me just make sure that, uh, that you see the thing that I mean. I'm just getting a link. So, you so the the structure is the one that's in the um, in the picture there. Sort of uh, halfway down the page, we've got five molecules lined up, and there's um, there's a few of the near neighbors up there now. So OSMS 35 doesn't have a lot of extra stuff on there, um, but it's still, of course, it's still not as good as the original GSK compound. But it's not outrageous. And was that the one that you tried the uh, the glute the thiol trapping uh, and the reduction on? Uh, I can't remember if it's that exact one, but it's that kind of I mean, it's that essential structure. Yeah, I don't I don't remember exactly which one, but it was the Fortron. Um, unless Murray and Alice have, have got that on them, um, uh, I, I don't know about that. But it's, it's one of those related structures. Yeah, um, and, and we found the double one was extremely unreactive. Which was a surprise. So I don't know. I mean, I, I I look at that and I think I mean it's a small molecule that, that we could that we could tinker with. Um, the the only reason I'm talking about that really is is the I, I don't know if you if you if you if you were as impressed as I am with the late stage community side asset whether that's a priority in your mind. Um, but the you know the original GSK compounds didn't hit that, whereas the near neighbors did. In, in they're really quite excitingly potent, and I don't know if that's a priority. Um, but it was a distinguishing feature between the two sets of compounds. I mean, I, th I, th I think for me it's it's nice to have, but but tied into that we've got to get oral activity into the series. That's that's the key thing that we're lacking. Uh, so even if you had gametocyte activity, but you couldn't get oral efficacy, you, you, you know further forwards. I think it's interesting. It's perhaps worth having just to think, are there any other things related to, to that structure we could make that would that would make it more drug-like? That, that would be worth an exercise uh, of thinking about that and seeing if there was a, a small set of targets. We might have to um, redo a little bit of uh, searching around some of these near neighbors and dig up the data that suggests. I mean, we, we could have a, have a search around one of those structures, dig up the data about the, the uh, chemical reactivity studies that Paul did, and then send. We've got a, several of these compounds still sitting in the fridge. We could send some to Sue if she's amenable to doing a glutathione um, trapping experiment. No, I think that's definitely worth it, and perhaps a general appeal on on the pages. You know, what what, what would you do next from from this lead? Uh, and let's just have a like a brainstorming session and collect some ideas. So, but you're not, um, you know, viscerally hostile to the idea of going back to one of these compounds. The structure makes me shiver a little bit when I look at it, but I'm not. Yeah, saying it's a definite no at this stage. I think it, it's worth having. Let's let's have a think and see see what's there. But I, I was quite impressed uh, with Murray's uh, predictive model, and I just wanted to ask as well whether we've then used the model to predict what the activity of the most wanted compounds, the ether, the sulfonamide, and the, uh, is it the oxidase? I can't remember what the third one is, because I'd almost use that as a stop go for those, that, that if we're actually predicting with the model, with all its flaws as it might be at the moment, that they're not likely to be active, then it may be worth just deciding to park them at this point. That 
that's a very good idea. Um, Nari, I'm not sure if you if you stuck the most wanted the three remaining wanted compounds into the model to check, check if they were predicted to be active. Um, so with that model I had, I I was focusing on the ether basically because the trouble we've had synthesizing it, and the the model as it stands, I could not shoehorn in the ether, although. As I was saying before, I, th I think there is there is obviously a third acceptor feature in there, so I'm kind of torn. I I'd like to say that I don't think the ether would be any more active than the carbonyl compound, which just got tested, uh, 103 that was. Um, but yeah, I think. Uh, I, I keep I keep kind of changing my mind, but I think the, the it would be useful to have the ether just to just to just as another data point for this model. Um, uh, as for the other two, no, I've not done any work on them, so I can't comment on those. But not not too difficult to, to slot them in to see what what we would predict them to to be like. It's easy. It's a, it's a. It'll take me longer to walk to pharmacy than it will to do the work. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing I was asking as well before, and I don't know if this is this is doable, but uh, with with that model, uh, whether you can um, try and elucidate what the molecules might be doing. In other words, target. Yeah, so you mentioned this earlier this week. Um, I guess in theory we could we could we we could set up a screen uh, of compounds that have been through like, like kinase panels, and then um, then if we if we could see any trends, you could make you could make educated guesses on possible targets. Um, so that that is doable. We just need to find data sets with. Um, with uh, compounds that have been through large kinase panels, I think, which should be accessible somewhere. Yeah, the the uh, the idea was to, uh, um, if you look, for example, at some compounds that hit the DHODH target, and see if there if there are known binders of that, and whether those structures map onto the structures that you're seeing that, that have good affinity. That's definitely doable. I mean, that could also be so. If, if it's if it's a pain, of course, you could also try and um, involve the people who just volunteered to help you out um, with that as well, uh, just to make sure that we we know what we're doing. Because um, I think the analysis could be to some extent open-ended. It's quite difficult to, to limit the number of targets you look at. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how you do that, but I, I guess somebody. Yeah, I think I think the problem here is we almost have too much data. So you could you could set. So usually with for microphone models, you never. You never just select one. You usually make five or ten, and then screen them all, and then take common hits. Um, w with the work I've done, the the different hypotheses which have come back have been very similar. So I've been fortunate enough just to narrow it down just to one, or just work with one, just for simplicity. Um, these new people, which are potentially on board, uh, they might have different methods and stuff, so it'd be interesting to see what they come up with and if they come up with the same answers and stuff. But yeah, it's 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 endless what we can do. It just it's a it's a time thing more than anything. And I, and I think um, what we've just got to bear in mind is that it's a very interesting exercise to, to go and do that piece of work and work out what the target might be. But in a brutal drug discovery uh, strategy, it doesn't move us forward at all in terms of moving this series to a point where, where it meets the, say, the early lead criteria. So, you know, I think it's just thinking how that fits into uh, our overall strategy or whether it's something that we that we, we would run on the side as sort of an interesting aside. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking um, about the paper to some extent that we that we need to get a publishable outcome. And so uh, sacrificing a little bit of time to, to polish those edges um, is would help us. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, yes, we, we, we were talking about that earlier on in the week. Um, the, you know, even if you find a target, what do you do with that information? I mean, you could sort of try and find other compounds that are going to hit that target and use some information about what's potent 
um, against that target. But yeah, you're right. It doesn't uh, it doesn't help us uh, according to the criteria that you just mentioned. Um, so speaking of which, uh, I mean the, uh, the 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 work that we were just talking about of, of perhaps tweaking the near neighbors is, is something that we can be doing. Um, if, however, we were going to entertain the idea of going for um, another series, then there are two possibilities, uh, I suppose, in general. One is that we try and run with one of the other series that we had on the back burner. And there were two of those that Jimmy was looking at. We validated the triazole urea compound, um, but we understand that there may be another group who may be interested in that set. There, um, we also then had the thionipyrimidine compound, which at the time of Jimmy's uh, thesis was submitted, uh, we couldn't get to, but Jimmy has now made that compound. Um, so we have a sample of that compound, so we've got this, this final Suzuki coupling working, which is fantastic. So we will shortly be sending off that compound to validate it um, for, with, with biological evaluation. Now given the materials that we have around, it should be relatively straightforward um, in January to make uh, variations in that compound, just to sort of you know make 10 or so compounds because we can vary either component, the boronic acid or the tiny pyrimidine. Um, and uh, Angela, who's with us uh, at the moment, doesn't know this yet, but she's, she's doing a summer project with us um, that's starting at the beginning of January. Um, and we were talking about your project and your absence, Angela, today. And we were thinking that this would be something that would be really good for you to do, uh, because Jimmy's just recently got this chemistry sorted out, um, and, and, and we could use it to generate a set of compounds which we then evaluate biologically, just to sort of check the series a little bit. Um, so there's those that are waiting on the sidelines. Um, if we if we were not to pursue one of those two series, um, then we'd have to think about another. Now we we again we're sort of just talking about the the remaining series that are in the uh, the GSK paper that came out um, earlier this year. I think the invitation to um, to pursue some of the series in the TCAMS data set, uh, and there are some remarkable series in there that are extremely simple. Um, we, of course, in this project don't know what other people are doing. So before we embark on that, of course, we'd have to have a discussion with you and with GSK about a series that might be appropriate. Uh, now, of course, we don't have to talk about that now because there may be some proprietary information there. Um, but before we embark on any of any new series, we want to have that conversation to ensure that we're, we're going after the right compound. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, updates on that, Paul, at the moment, or whether we, we want to try and um, have that conversation you know, after we've had this meeting and we can go back to GSK and talk to them. I mean, I, I've had that discussion with GSK, uh, so I know, I think, for all of the series in the paper which are being explored and aren't. So uh, I guess what's probably easier if, if people approach and say this is the one or two series that we're most interested in pursuing, then I can yep. say whether uh, they are already being explored. Uh, so, okay, sure. So, so I think we've got that. The other thing that is a possibility is that we've also got the MMV malaria box uh, where we're actually measuring the PK. So these are all known malaria actives from GSK Novartis and St. Jude's HTS. And we're also measuring the PK on those. So the other possibility is to select one of those that, that already has a uh -huh. Uh, and knowing the oral exposure and seeing if we can improve the potency or the other properties. So, uh, you know, I can offer one or two of those as well. So it might be worth a topic for the next meeting just to put on the table the options that, that we might want to consider for, for a new series and then, then to try and select the one that, that, that we think is, is the priority to, to start work with. Yeah, okay. That's. Uh... I mean, obviously, the uh, having PK data on some of those compounds already is very exciting. Um, and yeah, I mean, if those if those are looking good, then then we should perhaps divert to those. What I might suggest then, um, as, as a general um, thing for us to do, is to have the next of these meetings um, at about mid February. Uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm between a conference and a vacation in about mid February. Um, and I don't want to wait until I finish the vacation. So it would be good if we could have another meeting in mid-February. So after the Christmas, then we have January to do some synthesis, uh, then some evaluation, and we can meet, meet around mid-February. And then based on what we found in the interim, we can think about whether we're going to um, uh, divert to a, a different series. Is that a kind of time frame that, that everyone would be happy with, or uh, do people have something else in mind?
But I think what we use for then is just to have clarity on, on what the, the priority would be for synthesis in, in the interim, what would be the targets that, that we would be exploring, would be, be there, and have we made a decision, say, on the on the five that were the, the priority targets, or uh, are we going to go back and look at whether there's anything else worth doing on, on the near neighbours? So I think it'd just be worth clarifying that issue. But my, yeah, my preference, based on what we've been talking about, um, I think you're right that the that the assets are a bit of a weakness uh, in in the hybrid compounds, um, given that that's our central issue. I mean, my my preference at the moment would be to do a small exploration on on some of the near neighbours, to be sure that these are not microacceptors, and to see if we can make them a little bit more um, more soluble, um, and to look at some of those, um, mainly because of the potency that we saw, um, and because some of the molecules are actually still pretty small. Um, that would be my preference. At the same time, to make sure that we've validated and explored a little bit the thionopyrimidine set that uh, that Jimmy has now made the, the lead compound for. That would be my preference for you know synthetic uh, activity in January. Um, Alice and Murray, you guys are the are the ones who are actually going to be making some of these molecules. Um, we talked a little about a little bit about this this afternoon. Um, is is an exploration of the tiny pyrimidines and, and and some of the near neighbors uh, something that we can do in January? Okay. Yeah. I mean, so it'd be it'd be a pretty limited time frame thing because I think you know we 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 can't look at these series forever. But I think there's something um, there's something left in those uh, near neighbors that we should explore a little bit. Um, it seems to me. It would also give us a chance to try and source, um, uh, just to finish off the sulfonamide, um, which maybe uh, Patrick is, uh, can help us with, um, and to think if we can finally nail that ether compound, just to sort of polish those off. Again, it's, it's pretty much just for an academic <laughs> academic uh, uh, reason, just to make sure that we, we finish that off of the paper. Um, that, that would be my preference, but uh, um, I guess it, it depends how much we can get, get done in January. No, that's good, but I'd be happy to use Murray's uh, prediction at the moment to put the, okay. the three wanted through and just to prioritise. And I, I think it's, uh, to me, if, it, if there's a double hit, if we're not predicting they're active and the synthesis is looking tough, then there's not a strong case to, to continue and make. That's a, that's a very, that would be a very useful feature of what, of what Murray's done, yeah. Okay. But apart from that, yeah, your suggested plan looks good. All right, so I think in that case, um, while we are um, wrapping Christmas presents, we can we can be uh, posting online some suggested compounds that we should be going for, guided by log p and and what is to hand, um, and we can do a little bit of a consultation over the next week or so about uh, which compounds we should be targeting. I guess um, keeping the number pretty small, um, uh, but seeing uh, seeing if we can get a consensus by the beginning of January or so about what kind of compounds we want to be going after. Um, so that when we come back in January, we can be uh, we can be actually making these things. I I will also um, approach Sue to see if she has any spec capacity for a glutathione tracking experiment. Um, uh, and I want to dig up Paul's original data on the chemical stuff he did about the stability of the new neighbors to. So I think that's our, our line of attack. Now, of course, if anyone um, who is participating here, besides Patrick, um, who's already stuck his hand up for making the compound, if anyone sees something they would like to be involved with, then of course, please just say so, and we can do um, uh, we we can involve anyone in the, in the synthetic effort. Um, so it's a, it's an open project, which means anyone can, can take part. So if anything looks synthetically interesting, then um, please just uh, just say so. Um, and we can, of course, communicate offline um, uh, outside of this. Uh, what we might do, um, if everyone is, is happy, is, is we will set the time for the next meeting uh, early, sort of now-ish. We'll, we'll do it after this meeting, but we'll, we'll lock that in, um, if at all possible, um, so that we can uh, give people even more notice than we did this time. So one of the reasons why this meeting was, was moved around a little bit is we, we were waiting for the last bits of biological evaluation. But I think there's something to be said for 
just fixing the time for of the meeting a month in advance so that everyone knows it's coming and talking about whatever we have uh, up until that point. Uh, so I'd like to try and fix something in people's diary. If, of course, things go terribly wrong, we can shift it, but I'd like to get into the diary. Is middle of February any decent, is it okay time for you, Paul? I think yes. Generally speaking? Yes. Okay. We will uh, we'll try and do that. Okay, um, does anybody else, uh, sorry, so do, with Paul, is that um, that's a decent plan of attack until the next meeting? No, I think that looks good, Matt. I wonder if it's just worth, because there have been quite a few comments going past on the chat, so I don't know if it's worth just strolling through those or just asking anyone to raise their hand if there's a particular comment that they've written that, that they, they feel it'd be worth spending a minute or two uh, discussing, just conscious some people perhaps haven't had the chance to to, to, to get those points raised. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I noticed that Alison Murray have been pretty good at getting, getting the responses back. From what I can see, it's been a bit of a blizzard of comments. Does anybody, um, yeah, who's been typing comments in that chat box, uh, want to talk about something um, which hasn't been dealt with? It's a very good idea. Your your audio is enabled, Chris. I think you have to also enable it yourself. Up at the top of the screen, little microphone symbol. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah, you're on. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, as you can see on my, my blog post, I've just pontificated fairly randomly about about target mappings and uh, and MOAs. Um, you suggested that we could we could wait until early next year to have a little. Uh, Think about what we might do in that direction, in terms of how many uh, purified targets. Did did you pick up the paper from GSK where essentially they re I think they re ran the T camp set against the chosen target, and they published a lead on that. Um, which one was it? It was. Uh, you just shared that link. I think. Yeah, I did. So the enzyme was um, let's just open the link. Um, yeah, there was a thyroidoxin reductase. So uh, I just I, 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 I haven't seen it. All right. No, so it's just where we might be next year. Whether whether you can solicit help to to back up. The in silico predictions and the, and the models and the SAR to maybe test some of the leads across uh, across assays of purified targets because there's about yeah there's, so uh, there's about the... thirty in Kemble uh, there's about I was just looking through PubChem it's actually very hard to, to discern what's you get six hundred and twenty two proteins which collapse down to a small number of uh, of gene products, but there's there's a lot of stuff out there, and maybe worldwide there's a there's maybe twenty of these are running. You mean so you, you're you talking about physical assays and lineups? And we're talking yes, about yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're exactly, not talking about yeah. silica domain yeah. No, 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 no. no. For, yeah, so for, we, following we, up, we, the, following up the in silico efforts by seeing which uh, who essentially worldwide has has things running that. Um, uh, that could do the that could do the cross greens. Yes. Um, so we and did. And it, um, it, 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 it's at the start yeah. of the project. We, we we did approach GSK at the start of this thing, um, who very kindly agreed to run uh, this DHODH assay. And I haven't chased that, um, but should. That's one. Of course, what you're talking about is is broadening that out yeah. um, to see if we can run these compounds past other purified targets. Yeah. It's perfectly reasonable. We haven't done that search. We haven't contacted people. But if we knew our people who are running these things and who were willing to run our compact pass them, that would be fantastic. Well, I, I could probably, those yeah, people. I could probably have it. What I could, I could see what I can dredge up from public sources. I mean, now, for example, you, you've got 80 mapped into Kemble off the bat because they just now put their cross references into into Uniprot. So uh, normally, there's a, there's a well, sorry, no, about 70. 
uh, plasmodial proteins with with data in Kemble. So they somebody somewhere has run those. Yeah, uh, they they they'd actually collapse down as redundancy there. Um, but I I but I could have a look at that for sure. Yeah, and see if I can unravel. Um, uh, as I just put on the blog, the the Novartis group ran nine enzymes, but but their paper didn't get picked up in Kemble, so those enzymes are not anywhere outside. Yeah, you'd have to read the paper to find out. So it's that kind of thing. But I I can put together what I can, and then we'll have a a cogitate and. Um, because uh, yeah. as, as I put the arguments, I think it would be, uh, um, um, yeah. So, uh, what do you think, Paul? You you don't think targets is is so crucial, or are you? I mean, no. For MMV, if I'm being honest, it, it's not crucial. We, we would take things forwards into man without knowing the target. Obviously, if you do know, oh, it, yes. it's yeah, a bonus. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. It's not essential. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's definitely worth doing the exercise. What we tend to find is that people, uh, if they're not actually running assays on their target, often they don't still have that assay available. So, yeah, it can sure, be sure, 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 sure. And, uh, and what probably okay. helps, I don't know, if there were some silica predictions to sort of focus it. If if we believe it might be yeah. a particular target, I think. It would be easier to make the case then to uh, to get it measured on that target. Uh, it, it may be harder if we just try and get it screened against every target. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah. But I've um, I'd be interested, Paul, if, if you could have a quick glance at my my blog post where I've kind of assembled the arguments for doing an MOA. If you can, yeah. uh, you've been successful without it. I don't deny that, but I think it's still, um, you know. Being able to run HTS, you could bring through other series rapidly. Your SARs were well. You know all the arguments yeah, for for having a target. If you've got it. Sure. So that's it, Matt. I, 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 I definitely go and have a read of the blog, and let's just follow that up and discuss further for sure. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. I think it's a really good idea, and I think it's very much in line with the project, actually, that we, we try and find things that are happening around the world that are relevant and try and use those resources without duplicating and you know, uh, keeping overheads down by using what's available already. Uh, I think it's, it's a really good idea. I think, I think prioritizing based on some silico stuff yeah. is the right well, way to go. And that's the reason why we, we approached GSK about the DHA or the HSA, was because that was sure. the predicted most likely target. Um, Could but, I ask? I mean, absolutely, we don't. Um, I, I come from the, the background of, of schistosomiasis and prosequantal, and that thing's been used since the 70s, sure. and no one knows what it's doing. So, Can I ask Paul you know, something? Prevent you from having a knockout, knockout uh, drug. Paul, yeah. Paul, you you wrote you wrote an excellent review of all the patent literature. Did you try and source some of those compounds for standards? Uh, how many were there? There were lots. Uh, sorry, so what, what's the question? Uh, we've struggled no, to no, actually... No, yeah, sorry. To, Sorry, you wrote a you wrote an excellent review on the patent uh, patented compounds over the last two years with a colleague of yours. Did you did you try to see what you could source structures for whether they were, whether they were useful standards? I mean, no, we didn't. You? I guess because. It, it was yes, yes, and and we didn't take that exercise okay. again because I guess our strategy has been that the target hasn't been critical, and that the uh, the high throughput screening we've just done phenotypically has actually had a better success rate than than the target based design that was run previously. So uh, we we don't exclude okay. doing target. Okay, yeah, yeah, fair work. enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks very much, Chris. That's great. Um, uh, anyone else um, like to chip in? Um, uh, raise hand or chip in if you haven't felt as if you managed to say enough uh, in the chat window. Um, if not, we can conclude. Um, I'm uh, Commercial screening samples.
Uh, remind me, Murray, what, what's the issue with commercial screening samples? You are still enabled with the audio. Um, uh, I did something very rough a little while ago, and I can improve on it now because I have more confidence in the model, but um, I was just wondering the possibility of maybe buying 10 or 20 cheapish uh, samples to, to screen if we could source them and have them delivered before the next uh, batch of screening. Just It might also assist in, um, if we're looking to core hop or maybe Paul knows exactly what he wants us to do. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so in general terms, yeah, I mean, there's no, no question. It just depends on what we're, what we're trying to, you know, it depends on, on, the, on the nature of the compound. You know, so we, we previously had a bunch of commercial compounds because they, they looked attractive. Um, if we if we are doing some work on the new neighbor set, we do a search and then implies there are some commercial compounds that we haven't looked at yet, then of course we can do that. Um, I think this time, depending on the structures and depending on where they come from, we might consider getting them screened more locally uh, rather than being sent to Australia. Um, but you know, we, it depends where they're from and what they are. Is that what you mean? So you certainly we want to explore that, yes, in the way that we just did on the on the previous round. That was yeah. it. So I, I could easy or, or we we could easy um, generate a short list and put it up for uh, open debate on what what's useful to test or not. That's that's a fairly yeah. fairly easy to generate a list and then 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 take it from there. So I can do that. Uh, yes, yeah, fairly that's easy. Great. Okay. Sorry, what did you say, Paul? I, I think that's a great suggestion. Let, let's do that uh, and, and, and have an online discussion. I'm sure there will be some other compounds that it's worth purchasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yes, thank you for the offer, Chris. That would be very useful. Once we've got a, a couple of uh, compounds that we're, that we're deciding to be interested in, so a couple of representative near, near neighbor compounds, we should go back and look at uh, what's available and what's around, uh, particularly given that there's been such a big deposition of new data in, in mm -hmm. Comcast and other places. Okay, um, very good. It's quarter past two. We should probably wrap it up. Um, I think uh, it's been a very good discussion. I'm very happy with what we're going to be doing in the next month and a half or so. Um, uh, so, um, unless there's anything else, we can call that a wrap. No, that's great. Thanks all for staying so late in Australia. Really appreciate it. It was a good meeting. And, uh, look forward. That's all right. I've had enough coffee now. I can I can keep going. Um, all right. Yes. Thank you for, for coming. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, very much appreciated. Any other comments that you think uh, of after the meeting, just please put on on Twitter or, or G Plus, and we'll pick those up. Um, sometimes these meetings are pretty quick, like this, and people think of things after. So please feel free. Um, Thanks for coming. We'll arrange a meeting next time in February, and hopefully everyone can come again and uh, and, and look at what's going on. Um, and, and please do give us any suggestions that you think that we've, we've missed. Um, I think the chat say, actually, one of you, Mario or Alice, if you wouldn't mind just doing a quick copy and paste onto Notepad or something, just make sure we capture that chat in case it's not saved. That would be a good idea. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll see you again next time. See you guys. <laughs>